All right, everyone, welcome to our next session for the Family Cafe. Please welcome our next presenter, Paula Burns from Early Steps. Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you. Happy to be here. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Paula Burns, and I work in the Early Steps program. So um, even though we are a birth to three program, I um, assure you that someone will learn everything today. Or each of you will learn something today. That's what I meant to say. So let's begin. All right. So I've got some slides, uh, but also feel free to just look at me if you want to, and I can send you the slides later. So um, we're going to go over a little bit about early steps and what we are. Uh, most of you here at the Family Cafe probably know, uh, but we are live on Facebook. So I wanted to make sure um, I had the opportunity to make sure everybody knows what early steps is and it's accessible and available for uh, infants and toddlers in the state of Florida. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about me. Um, there's a reason for that, and, and I'll get to that in just a moment. And we're going to talk about in, incorporating learning in your everyday routines and activities and using recycled items to help develop in infants and toddlers. And again, don't worry if uh, you don't have infants and toddlers. Um, you'll, I promise that there'll be some things that you can learn. So I'm going to start out with Welcome to Holland. And if you have not heard this poem, I know many uh, people here at the Family Cafe have heard this pro po poem, um, but I also have a little video um, of this poem that we're going to play. Hopefully if my slide will go forward here. I might need some tech help. Yeah, if you can advance it. Yeah, it's not. There we go. Welcome to Thank Holland, you. a poem by Emily Kingsley, narrated by Alicia Rosen. I am often asked to describe the experience of raising a child with a disability. To try to help people who have not shared that unique experience to understand it. To imagine how it would feel, it's like this. When you're going to have a baby, it's like planning a fabulous trip to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks, and you make your wonderful plans. The Colosseum. The Michelangelo's David. The gondolas in Venice. You may even learn some handy phrases in Italian. It's all very exciting. After months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives. You pack your bags and off you go. Several hours later, the plane lands. The stewardess comes in and says, Welcome to Holland. you say. What do you mean, Holland? I signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy. All my life I've dreamed of going to Italy. But there's been a change in the flight plan. They've landed in Holland and there you must stay. The important thing is that they haven't taken you to some horrible, disgusting, filthy place full of pestilence, famine, and disease. It's just a different place. So you must go out and buy a new guidebook. And you must learn a whole new language. And you will meet a whole new group of people you would have never met. It's just a different place. It's slower paced than Italy. Less flashy than Italy. But after you've been there for a while and you've catched your breath, you look around and you begin to notice that Holland has windmills. Holland has tulips. Holland even has Rembrandts. 
but everyone you know is busy coming and going from Italy, and they're all bragging about what a wonderful time they've had there. And for the rest of your life, you will say, yes, that's where I was supposed to go. That's what I had planned. The pain of that loss will never, ever go away. Because the loss of that dream is a very significant loss. But if you spend your life mourning the fact that you didn't get to go to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy the very special, the very lovely things about Holland. All right, so if you haven't heard that poem before, um, I think it even uh, is a little bit more dramatic when you see it uh, written out that way um, with pictures, right? So uh, it touches the hearts of families that have, are on this journey. So early steps, we're gonna talk a little bit about early steps. We are the early intervention program in the state of Florida, and uh, we serve children birth to three, we are funded under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA. So we're part C of IDEA. Uh, part B would be school district services. So if you've heard of IDEA, that's probably uh, what you've heard more of. So we are a federal program that states participate in voluntarily and require uh, a program to be comprehensive, coordinated, and family focused. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the family-focused piece of that. And the goal is really to provide the early inter intervention services for infants and toddlers, birth to three, whether they have an established condition or a developmental delay. So we, as I mentioned, are statewide. So these are all our different regions. The highlighted one there, the candy stripes, I get the fun candy stripe one. So I am West Central. And I am a family resource specialist with the Early Steps program. So each one of these areas is required to have a family resource specialist. And that's important to know because we're there representing families. We are there to be the voice of families uh, within the system. So I mentioned established conditions. So children that are born with established conditions, uh, neurological disorders, uh, low birth weights, and then also those uh, that are not following their milestones uh, that are appropriate for their ages uh, can be eligible and get services under our program. So if you know a child, um, parents can contact our program directly. Uh, sometimes they are referred by a physician, child care worker, social service provider, but parents can always, uh, caregivers can always contact us directly. That 800 number is actually a central number, and so it doesn't matter what part of the state you're in, um, you can call that number. So families get a service coordinator that uh, is their go-to person in the program. And usually we evaluate the child, determine what types of services they need, and then develop an individual family support plan, or an IFSP. So that all happens within 45 days. And then after that 45 days, we identify a primary service provider within 30 days um, to provide those services. So there's a lot of uh, policies that we are federally mandated to follow. And the biggest part is that we're family-centered, and the services are based on the priority of the family and the child's, uh, child and family's concerns. So we provide all our services uh, to the greatest extent possible um, in the natural environment, and that is not just a place. Uh, that can be routines, that can be activities, or the places uh, basically wherever typical developing children are and spend their time. So if they're home with mom during the day, if they're going to the grocery store with mom, if they're in a daycare center, um, we provide those services. So mentioned that I'm a family resource specialist and the heart of our program is the families. So every family resource specialist across the state, and some of them are in the room today, um, are we are family members of someone, a child, um, who either received early intervention services or who may have been eligible um, for one uh, for getting services. So we connect families with other families, that parent-to-parent -parent support. 
and we're also that family voice within the system. We listen to families, and then we also speak on behalf of families um, with our state office and in our local system. So if you are a parent in an Early Steps program in the state of Florida, or if you have a friend that is, make sure they connect with their family resource specialist because we're there with personal experiences. So here's mine. This is Jeremy, and I have a little video to share. So this is Jeremy when he was just hours old. Um, he was born at 39 weeks. His APGAR scores were a seven and a nine. And uh, they discovered that he had had a brain bleed. Um, so when he was just a few hours old, he was transported to uh, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. And uh, he went through early steps. He then transitioned to pre-K, which I'm not quite sure I, as a parent, was quite ready for. This was actually a video of him on his first day of school. So um, he was dancing a little bit to the music, you know, when he was in the house. But then um, I think once he got in the car and started to head to school, I think I like to say he looked like he was scared to death. But I think I was actually more scared than he was because um, I was sending my baby to school, right? So he didn't start walking until he was 27 months old. Um, he didn't talk or eat solid foods until he was four and a half. So he made every therapist that worked with him work for their money. <laughs> he, made, he made them work hard, <laughs> um, challenged every single one of them. Uh, but this is uh, now coming up, Jeremy today. Hi, uh, I'm Jeremy. I'm an adult, uh, and uh, I love Ladybug TV show. And look, I got a smile because he's a teenager. That's about all I could get, right? <laughs> Ten seconds of, of talking and, and a smile. So, um, so as I mentioned, he had a brain bleed. So on, on the picture here, you can see a slice of one of his first CAT scans. So um, it resulted in a lot of fluid built up. And uh, he did have a shunt put in, um, had three brain surgeries before the age of six months. And uh, he has a, a laundry list, if you will, of um, diagnoses, those quote unquote labels that um, make him eligible to get services. Uh, but as you saw in the video of Jeremy now, uh, it does not define who he does or what he's capable of doing. So, and he likes to always surprise us. Last year in the middle of the pandemic, um, his shunt that it had been at, in and working for 18 years uh, snapped in a little portion. So we found ourselves in the emergency room all of a sudden uh, with an emergency brain surgery. So um, he likes to keep us on our toes. Jeremy's been actually attending the Family Cafe with us since 2008, so if this is your first year at the Family Cafe, I can tell you this is like a family reunion for our family every year. Um, if you were here in the last in-person Family Cafe and you recognize that teddy bear, uh, that was actually Jeremy. Um, we have a local support group called Hugs of Florida, and Jeremy, um, because of the sensory processing disorder, he came up with the idea that he wanted us to have a mascot, and he wanted to wear that costume to kind of overcome the sensory integration. So when we first got the costume, which we were hesitant to purchase because it was, you know, a little bit expensive, but we knew he wanted to do it, and it was a goal for him. So um, he would wear the head for, like, 20 seconds, and then, okay, okay, I got to take it off now, you know, <laughs> I got to breathe, I got to breathe, and i um, happy to share that when he was at the conference and entertaining the little kids uh, a couple years ago, he was keeping that costume on for 20 or 30 minutes, so if your children, you know, have, have a goal and want to act on something to help them overcome um, one of their challenges, uh, I would definitely highly recommend that you give it to them. And I don't know if you recognize anybody in, is anybody in this picture that I have up here? Is anyone in the room that's in this picture? So that was actually taken in 2005. And a lot of times uh, people see me and they look, they're like, you look really familiar. I know that name Paula. So yes, I am also the Zumba instructor here at this family cafe. Uh, this 
uh, bigger picture is from 2019, where we had a great group of us all dancing together. And we will be bringing that back next year, but because of uh, the pandemic this year, we're keeping everybody safe. So, um, but yes, if, if you think there's a double around here, I'm the same person. Zumba is my stress relief, so. Um, and I like to say when it comes to disabilities and, you know, my story, we, you know, I don't believe in the miracles. I, I depend on them. And in early steps, so many of, so many kids have miracles, yes, right? So that was Charlie Brown. Do you remember Charlie Brown? You remember that teacher that rah, 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 like that's all you heard, right? So when we got into early steps, I had been in video production um, my whole life before then. I had worked in video production and graphics, so I knew nothing about child development. And then all of a sudden, I have a child that isn't meeting his milestones, and I go to early steps, and they're telling me all these things I'm, I guess I'm supposed to know, right? And I didn't realize at the time that the most important thing for me to do with Jeremy was to play, right? Children have to play. And I like to share this because it seems so simple to some of us that work in the industry now, but I always remind my coworkers and colleagues that not every family has worked in child development. Not all of us know child development and know that the work of children is to play, and that's how we learn, and that's how they learn to communicate, and that's how they learn about life. So part of what we do in Early Steps is help to kind of guide families along that path. Um, so if you have a child that's in our program, or even if they're beyond the age of three and they're still learning and developing, the best thing you can do is to give your child experiences. Yes, everybody always wants to add more services and therapies, and even those, those things, you know, sometimes, you know, can be helpful. The most important thing that you can do to help your child is to give them life experience, to help them work every day in your daily routines. And we're going to go through a little bit and talk about that. So. Child development, who knows what child development is? So don't worry, there's apps that can help you. So one of the great organizations, Zero to Three, uh, has an app that's available both on Android and the iPhone, and it's called Let's Play. And I'm gonna show you a couple of the screenshots in this app because you can go in, and even if you don't necessarily know child development or know what type of skills your child would need to start working on, you can go and pick one of those categories, like you know, exploring, listening, homemade toys, you know, different things like that, talking about language. You can go pick one of those categories, you pick the age of your child, and then it will step through and give you suggestions and give you day-to-day -day ideas of what you can do to help your child um, with their development. There's another one that's a great brain-building app called Daily Room. So, um, and that again is uh, available both on Android and, and iPhone and free, by the way, which is always good. So that's another one um, to check out. And again, I've got a couple of screenshots there that you can see. Um, it's really helpful, you know, especially when you're on the go, if you're busy and you're, you know, taking your child to appointments and things like that, you know, you can sit there and call up this app and, and you know, got ideas for driving in the car and, um, you know, while you're sitting and waiting, you know, all those types of things. So check those out. There's also some great book resources, although I feel like everybody does so much electronic, but um, these are some good suggestions for play and language um, for birth to three age groups. So um, you can find those in your public library and some early steps offices do actually have a lending library of books. So again, that connection with that family resource specialist is gonna be the key to getting access to all of those things. So I'm gonna go through uh, now some of those low tech um, recycled ideas uh, that we talked about um, that we're gonna cover now. So one of the things that children need to learn is the socialization with people play and um, they do that by imitating facial expressions, um, animal sounds, you know, playing peekaboo, those kinds of things. Um, found a great nursery rhyme, uh, and I, I'm not actually gonna play this right now because then I might start dancing, but um, 
it's uh, under Coco Melon. It's available on YouTube, and it talks about facial expressions. It talks about being happy. It shows faces. And um, now, not to say that you're going to go sit your child in front of YouTube and just have them watch this video over and over, right? But it, what it's going to do is be a tool for you to learn to. Um, you know, encourage those types of things from your child. There's also some basic household items that you can use. A mirror is a very simple object that, even if you don't have a mirror, sometimes just use the reflection of, you know, a, a, um, pots and pans and things like that to show the facial expressions. And, you know, the reason for the mirror is because you want to make sure you're over exaggerating those uh, facial expressions for your child. So, you know, you do the big smile, stick your tongue out, you know, say cheese, show yourself angry, and, and do all those expressions for your child so they see and hear those emotions. Um, and then the, the little puppet hand thing there, so that's a good idea. Like, if you have a child that uh, you like to read books to, right? But they need, um, you know, perhaps they don't stay focused looking at just the pages of the books. If you could take a glove, you know, many of these things you could purchase from the dollar store, take a glove, um, some, those are little buttons that are just sewed or glued onto the glove. And in this example, like this would be like, are you reading a book about the little ducks, you know, the five little ducklings, but actually using that object while you're reading the book so then your child has something to inter interact with that is right there um, and tactile to them. So. Um, cooking experiences are a great, great way to engage your child in those daily, daily routines. Um, bath time learning is another one. And, you know, sometimes children are challenged um, with being able to sit up uh, and, you know, we find the need to start looking into possibly getting, you know, expensive bath chairs and things like that. There is a low-tech version that, um, and, and the TV, um, I'm going to get back to the bath thing in just a minute, but um, watching TV, even though for this age group we don't recommend a lot of screen time, um, and we being the Association of Pediatric <laughs> Doctors, not me personally, but, um, you know, we, TV is good if you're engaged in your child in a conversation. Don't just sit them in front of screen or TV. Sometimes, you know, you need to get things done, so, you know, you, you have to put something on to keep them amused. But, you know, while you're watching, you know, Bob the Builder or um, Barney or I don't know what kids watch these days because my kid's old, right? <laughs> but um, when you're watching some of those, you know, talk about what they're seeing, you know, have that conversation with them and talk about what they're seeing on the screen and, and make that um, part of that interactive learning um, opportunity. Mentioned the bath time. Uh, laundry baskets are a great low-tech um, item for children that you know, aren't quite sitting up. Uh, this particular one is a fairly large size one, but there are some that are circular. And again, not that you're going to leave your child totally unattended in the bathtub, right? But um, just giving them something to give them a little bit of support. Uh, if they needed a little bit more support than just that plastic um, laundry basket, you could add like a um, pool noodle, you know, right under their arms to give them a little bit, bit more stability. So um, there's a lot of things like this that you can, you know, just kind of think outside the box a little bit uh, rather than going right out to, to purchase that really expensive equipment first. And then also, you know, we want children to learn how to take care of themselves, how to be able to bathe themselves and wash themselves. But when they have challenges with their fine motor skills, with their hands, uh, you know, sometimes we, we just kind of do it for them. And I'm, I'm one of those guilty parents, right, that does it for my son. So uh, this is another suggestion, um, taking a piece of um, elastic and attaching it to that washcloth. And you put that over the wrist of the of your child. Um, so even if they're not completely able to grasp that washcloth, um, they will still feel successful in, you know, trying to engage in bathing themselves by not losing grip of having that um, attached to them. Just make sure it's not tight on the elastic and stuff, but that's just a good idea. Um, and, and again, not just for infants and toddlers, you know, there's no age limit with development. We're all constantly 
learning and developing. So if there's older children, you know, perhaps this is something you might want to try with them. Playing with toys, uh, you know, the, the ones, not the ones with all the bells and whistles and lights and noises and all those things, you know, think basic. Think back to those Fisher-Price farms, you know, the, you can get a lot of them from the flea market. And even if you only find the little animals at the flea market, you know, take a cardboard box and make the farmhouse out of a cardboard box. And using um, a sandbox, uh, rice and pasta, I think I have a, another um, example of that a little bit later. Action figures, uh, a lot of the little toys, you know, they, they don't always stand up. And I know personally my son would get a little frustrated when they wouldn't stand up. So here's some ideas. You were using the shower hooks, um, glue in a shower hook perhaps onto the top of a toy, or uh, poker chips, again, dollar store. You can buy a whole stack of them. And uh, putting those on the bottom just to give a little bit of a base to that toy so that way when they do try to stand all their toys you know, lined up in the farmhouse or whatever that they don't get frustrated trying to stand up the toys and they can feel successful and build their confidence, right? So they want to do more. Um, there's a million ideas out there on the internet and this is one uh, great online resource um, called Fabricate. And I'm not going to actually click on the website and stuff because, you know, you, that's your homework to do. So uh, if... and. I know that they are uh, recording this and it will be um, available later for viewing, but if anybody does want a copy of these slides um, in the Family Cafe app or um, on the program, it's got my contact information. Um, feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to send you a copy of the slides so you'll be able to click right on these links and you don't have to write all these things down. So happy to share the resources. All right, so some general suggestions when you're working with your child and uh, trying to help them, you know, engage them in learning. Try to avoid just yes and no questions. Try to ask more questions. So instead of just saying, you know, do you want milk? You know, do, would you like milk or would you like juice? Giving them choices, giving them something to um, answer with instead of just a yes, no question. And, you know, they may not always... Um, or for a while, come out with those words or pointing, but try to always encourage everything that you do with that uh, communication, with that language. Um, and even though you feel like you might be talking to yourself, keep on doing it, because I promise you, I never thought my son would talk, and then once he was, you know, in preschool and, um, you know, around other children and, and the speech therapies and all those things, um, he did. And... Now that he's 19, sometimes it's hard to get him to shut up. So <laughs> I know, Jeremy, you better be watching. It's not nap time yet, right? So <laughs> he's probably watching. He's going, oh, mom, really? <laughs> so um, some, some other things to keep in mind when children are playing with blocks, um, they are learning, you know, using their imagination. They're using, a, you know, learning about size and shape. Um, building up, you know, creating patterns, matching colors, all those types of things. Children sometimes have challenges with transitioning from one thing to another, so building a visual schedule. Uh, for older children, you know, those visual pictures are great, but when you're dealing with children in the birth to three age group, uh, you know, they're not always going to be engaged with something that's just a, a piece of paper. So creating something on, whether it's a shelf, uh, some sort of a visual schedule using colored blocks to kind of grab their attention, and then using three-dimensional objects. So the ball would be like for going outside to play, and then perhaps we're going to sit in color, so you put crayons there, and then it's going to be time for lunch. So we put a cup there, and giving them those step-by-step things to look forward to and to predict what's coming next. And a lot of these ideas um, that I'm sharing today came out of this uh, Easy at Two booklet that's on the PACER um, website. So it's, I think, about a 40-page booklet that you can download or just look electronically that has a lot of great ideas and um, you know, submissions for um, this age group. Books are great for, um, of course, every child, but sometimes even the board books are a challenge for those fine motor skills. So if you can glue little, the little 
dots, um, little popsicle sticks on the pages, something that they can grab a hold of to turn those pages so um, you know, they can be engaged when you're reading that book and you're not just doing all the reading. You, know, you can do hand over hand, grab their hand, and turn that page with them. And, you know, once, once you start to see that and you see your child react when they get so excited because, you know, they did something and, you know, they, they realize that they're capable of doing things, it, it encourages them to do so much more. So um, when children are playing with art materials, uh, my son was not a big art materials person. He hated getting messy, right? The whole, um, you know, sensory challenges with playing with, you know, paints and things like that on his hands, but he, you know, would like the paintbrush and stuff like that. So, you know, learning about colors and textures, playing with art, um, whether it's paint or crayons, um, is, is something you can do. If you don't want to be, do messy or if you have a child that doesn't want to be messy, give them a bucket of water and a paintbrush and let them go outside and paint the sidewalk, you know, with just water and, you know, just to give them and engage them in the activity of, of moving and those fine motor skills and, um, you know, doing something. And uh, I mentioned earlier the, you know, using pasta, raisins, noodles, um, all those types of things and Tupperware even in a, you know, empty plastic water bottle um, to make little shakers, little sound noises, um, you know, for them to play with. So it's another idea. Um, when children work and play with art materials, you know, they're learning, of course, to use their imagination. They're learning to make choices, you know, picking the colors, expressing themselves, um, textures. You know, don't forget paper is not the only thing that they can paint on. You know, go to the dollar store, get, you know, some stones, uh, some other materials and things that they can color and... Uh, you know, feel the different textures, um, perhaps even buying a bath sponge at the dollar store and, and dipping that in the paint and let them do some sponge painting and, um, you know, get used to those textures and colors and working with those different tactile things. So, um, did I go backwards? There we go. <laughs> and, of course, sometimes we have children where, you know, they don't want to sit still and... It's important to make sure that when you do try to get them to sit and engage in an activity, you know, make sure that their feet are touching the ground. A lot of times kids fidget because they can't find their balance in space. You know, perhaps their feet aren't touching the ground. So using just the lid of a box, um, you know, even cutting off part of a box or a box flat, um, and putting it underneath the, the chair itself. Again, everyday item, something you can recycle instead of going and buying some expensive, you know, chair. Uh, you know, try this first and see if it works. And, you know, once the box gets old, you can always replace it and use it for something else. So, uh, so that's just a suggestion for, you know, kids that might be fidgeting a little bit and, and need, you know, that extra support um, to engage when kids play with household items, uh, one of the most important things they do is learn the roles of the mother and father, um, you know, and, and things that mom does, things that dad does, and sometimes those things are all intertwined these days, which is a beautiful thing. Uh, working with others, you know, learning how to ter take turns. Perhaps there's a sibling and, you know, one of them gets to stir the mixture in the kitchen first and then, you know, let the brother take turns. And they also, you know, they mimic your actions. They pantomime your actions. So they learn to um, engage in activities um, once you start doing that. And in the kitchen, uh, magnets, uh, I know, again, I, I keep saying the dollar store, but you can tell I'm a big dollar store fan. Although the problem is I go in the dollar store and then I spend like $60 in the dollar store because I found like 60 things, right? So <laughs> the dollar store is good if you have, you know, if you can keep yourself in limits. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, magnetic letters, um, not that we are expecting them to spell words when they're infants and toddlers, right? But just learning to move colors around and see the different shapes and letters and things like that. 
And then you know what? Let them make music. Put on a song, give them a pot and pan, and let them just play. Let them bang away at the drum. Let them have fun while you're trying to get dinner together. You know, there's, there's things you can do in your everyday routines that's, that's going to help them develop and make food fun. Okay, so these are totally fun. Did you ever have food like this when you were growing up? I didn't, but I think... You know, having the little uh, caterpillar grapes might have made me eat more fruit when I was younger. So, um, you know, making silly faces out of pieces of uh, fruit, you know, on peanut butter, because uh, that makes it stick, which is cool. So just some cute ideas for making food fun and, you know, engaging children in, and especially if you have a picky eater, Jeremy. <laughs> He's like, Mom. But... Um, Jeremy's a picky eater, so, you know, it's always been a challenge trying to figure out what those things are that um, he'll like to eat and would like to try, and a lot of times, honestly, we had to just hide things <laughs> to get him to eat, right? But, um, you know, given some ideas like this, you know, might, might help children to uh, try, try new things. So now let's move to the outside. So when kids, kids are running outside, they're playing outside, whether it's in your backyard or the playground. Um, you know, of course, they're relaxing, having fun, you know, hopefully engaging in some of the social skills with other children. But they're also learning, you know, the limitations or what their body can do. So, of course, we want to make sure they're safe while they're doing those things. But you can talk about the sun, you can talk about the clouds, talk about the weather. If it starts raining, how fun is that, right? Go run out and dance in the rain. So um, those are just some suggestions on helping um, your child with their development while they're outside. And when they are playing with water, taking them to the beach. Gosh, we live in Florida, so there's a beach just about anywhere that you go. So, you know, some of the things they learn every day when they're playing with water, playing at the beach with the sand, you know, they, they learn what floats, what doesn't in the bathtub. Um, that's a great way to learn. And then, um, you know, combining materials. You know, it's the start of those whole science experiments, you know, with playing with sand and water. Another uh, resource for online, do to learn, um, when you're Looking at communication, social skills, uh, behavior regulation. So if you have a child that, you know, gets very frustrated doing activities, um, they have a lot of great information on this website. And, I mean, literally thousands of things that are available. So um, songs, games, all kinds of stuff that uh, can help give you ideas and help your infants and toddlers engage. Uh, learning colors. Um, you know, we don't, again, you know, kids, as they get in school, you know, they're expected to do so much more. When Jeremy started preschool back in 2004, uh, he had a little object. You know, when he went to school every day, he had a little train that had his name on it, and he had to move it from the little home to the little school, you know, thing in preschool. Now, like, their name is written in cursive, and it's written out. There's no objects. Like, you know, like, kids are expected to do so much more um, as they get, you know, younger and younger, um, it seems. So anything that you can do as they're learning when they're in this birth to three age group or beyond, you know, anything you can do matching colors as you walk around the, the house, um, you know, instead of just asking if they want milk or juice for breakfast, you know, would you like a yellow cup or a red cup with your milk or juice today? And give them options and let them pick the color. Let them pick the cup. Um, laundry. Start them young with laundry. Matching, sorting the laundry, you know. There's nothing wrong with child labor, right? <laughs> Put them to work. Let them, you know, give them the socks. Give them, you know, the small objects that they can help them be successful. And yes, it takes longer, right, when you have your child helping you. And maybe not everything is sorted perfectly, but it's a great way to, you know, engage with your child and spend time with them doing something that's meaningful that's going to help them later in life. So it's never too young to start with that. And then using the you know, learning numbers, using the one words one in daily routines, you know, talk when they're, you're dressing them, talk about, you know, we're putting one arm in, now we're putting the other arm in, and we're going to 
put your head through and, and talking through as you're dressing them and helping them to learn, um, you know, not just numbers, but the colors and objects and body parts and all those things. So all good things you can do. Reading, I've already, already mentioned that reading at least one book daily to your child is, is really good. Um, limiting monitor and screen time, and that doesn't mean just TV. <laughs> that means phones, too. I know it's so easy to just, you know, be able to go out to eat and, you know, give your child the phone and let them just watch something so you can have a peaceful meal. But, you know, try to engage in a conversation about what they're watching. You know, try to make that um, part of... of you know, the routine, part of what they're doing. So they used to not just sitting and watching a screen and learning from that, but learning to engage in conversation with you. Um, and of course, making sure that they get enough rest and healthy meals is important. And providing those experiences, you know, in early steps, um, even though we do, you know, most of the services are in, done in the daycare or the home, you know, if, if, if you're challenged by taking your child to the grocery store and, you know, they throw a little fit every time you go to the grocery store, ask your early interventionist to see if they can, your next session, meet you at the grocery store and go with you and see what might be triggering um, the challenges and those things and see if they can help you through those things. That's what we're there for. We're there to really help and coach families to you know, help their child, their development, and get them to move with, move those milestones and keep on moving. These are another uh, couple of low-tech examples. Again, the inexpensive poker chips or little objects that you can buy at the dollar store using recycled um, Pringles cans are great or, you know, containers, Tupperware, cutting a little slit in there. You know, you don't have to go out and buy the expensive, fancy shape sorters to get the same, you know, result. Um, and the same learning experience. There's a lot of things you can do with stuff right around your house. Everybody has one of these platters, right? You bought it with the intention that when you go to a party, you were going to cut up all the fruit and vegetables, and you were going to take it, right? And then every time you go to a party, you go to Publix or Walmart, and you buy one of those ones that's already cut up because it's easier, right? So here's a, here's a great idea to use this instead. You know, get some little counting bears or, you know, just little colored objects. Um, and, you know, have your child learn to, to sort, whether it's same objects or same colors, you know, learning, learning those things. Uh, sometimes children that have uh, fine motor delays have challenges with, like, threading and lacing and those types of ideas. These are a couple of different levels um, using just a, a wooden or plastic spoon with slices of a pool noodle. Um, much larger than, you know, the little um, books with the shoelaces, right, for children, um, especially in this age group. So this is a very simple way of showing them how to put an object, you know, on top of another one. And something that's very simple but would help them feel um, successful and then the little whole um, ball, if you will, uh, the other thread with that is actually what you can get at the craft store. It's like a bolo. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a pipe cleaner. It's a little bit thick. It's not just like a shoelace. So having something that has a little bit more um, stiffness and not so flexible can help children to be able to guide things a little bit better, especially if their fine motor skills aren't quite... Um, aren't quite there yet, and they're still developing. So these are a couple of, you know, kind of little step ideas um, to help, again, engage in those things. You know, therapy is a wonderful thing, and, and, you know, therapists are wonderful people, but parents can do a lot of these things in their day-to-day -day routines in addition to that that's going to help, you know, to accelerate um, the learning and the development um, with your child. And, uh Gosh, I heard on a workshop a couple of weeks ago, um, actually uh, one of the music classes that we do with Early Steps Families, uh, Music with Mayor, and you know, she said that children have to do something like 1,200 times to know if they really like, like it or not, and, and you know, it, to know if they really want to engage and do, do stuff like that. So, you know, just because you do it 10 times with your child and they weren't interested or they're, you know, they get frustrated with it, 
Try it an 11th time, try it a 20th time. You know, don't give up, keep trying with them because you know, one day it will click and one day you know, they'll engage. And you know, maybe, maybe the object you're using isn't their favorite color. You don't know, right, if they're not speaking. So maybe trying a different object, trying a different color um, you know, to help get them engaged. My son always uh, has, so he has hemiplegia, cerebral palsy on one side. So when we play like family card games, it was very difficult for him to be able to grab a card while holding the cards because he couldn't hold the cards in his, in his hand. So um, we would use like a, a hairbrush, you know, just to use as like a little ho card holder, if you will. You can buy the fancy card holders, but you can also buy a hairbrush at the dollar store. <laughs> Back to that spending hundreds of dollars at the dollar store, right? <laughs> so as children get older, you know, the grips um, in the exhibit hall right now, you know, there's places that are giving out the little, um, you know, stress balls and things like that. You know, you probably will never use it, you think, right? But go grab those little stress balls and you can pop a little hole in it and put it around a crayon or a... Um, pencil or pen, you know, to give them something bigger that they can hold on to, that they can grip with. Um, you know, if they haven't quite figured out that grip and those fine motor skills yet, you know, giving something to them to help them be successful. And then these are just some ideas for communication. You know, if they are getting frustrated, you know, with communication and you start to see behaviors come out because of that, you know, using uh, just a simple like photo keychain, printing on a couple of pictures, even like a little photo book, and you know, putting those things in there. So, little magnet frame, stick it on the fridge. They can point to what they might want to choose for um, breakfast. Uh, great ma uh, materials exchange resource is this speakingofspeech.com um, website. So. Bookmark that, and um, if you go up to Materials Exchange in their top bar, there's a lot of great ideas for helping to engage kids in communication. Um, and then this is, I think, I, what I mentioned uh, as not not just for communication, but if you have a child that's challenged with, you know, transitioning from one idea to another, you know, use pictures of them actually doing that. Um, that activity, whether it's eating or going outside, and help to learn them, you know, to predict what's coming next by putting that next on the page and, um, you know, using those things to help with their development. And then these are just some fun ideas that I found over the years as I've built this presentation. Um, you know, you'll sometimes drive down a street and see an old entertainment center, and um, I've seen them turned into like little kitchens because uh, those little plastic ones are super expensive. And I don't know if you've ever tried to put them together, but they're even crazier. <laughs> so find something that's already put together. And um, I've seen them done as kitchens. I've also saw a really cute one that was done like a little workshop, like a little, um, you know, workshop for like a little boy or something. So that's just one idea. If you've got an old plaque and play for when they were an infant, you know, turn that, you know, cut off the side, the mesh from one side and um, put the little, uh, I guess it's the um, mattress cover over the top and make it like a little reading tent, you know, make it fun for children to sit and read. So get them engaged in that. This is a great idea for um, specifically for Easter, but, you know, if you're having an Easter egg hunt and you have a child that is a little bit slower than all the other kids, you know, make it, make it a rule that everybody has to only pick up their colors, right? Whatever color bucket you have, that's the color eggs that you can get. So everybody gets equal amount of eggs, right? So you don't have the big kids. And, and this, I mean, even for, even if you don't have a child that has developmental delays, this is good for most kids because there's always those fast obnoxious kids, right, that go grab all the eggs from all the little ones. So that's just a, a cute idea for Easter. Um, pool noodles are your friend. They're great for when you're transitioning, perhaps out of that toddler bed into a bigger bed, and you're afraid your child might, um, you know, spill out on the floor. Um, you know, obviously putting the mattress down on, right on the floor is a good start and a good step, but using a pool noodle under a fitted sheet is a great idea. You can use more than one, too. You know, use a, a wall of pool noodles, if you will. 
um, just to give it a little speed bump, you know, <laughs> so they won't roll over out of the bed. So, um, and then don't forget, I mentioned the um, farmhouse earlier, you know, for, uh, you know, animal noises, you know, learning about animals, learning about the farm, all those things. Um, the rice, uh, sand, you know, in Ziploc bags, you know, making shakers in water bottles. There's just so many things that, you know, as you start to look around your house, you'll start to see more and more things going, ah, oh, I remember she said something about that. So, um, and one most important final thought I want to leave you with is that child, childhood is not a race to see how quickly a child can read, write, or count. Childhood is a small window of time to learn and develop at the pace which is right for each individual child. So don't think just because, you know, the neighbor's child is doing something that your child is, you know, any less because they're a little bit delayed with those things. You know, they're going to get there and, you know, sometimes exceed what those neighbor's kids are doing. So there's no right or wrong to child development that they all develop and there's no time limit to that development, um, not just for you know, reading and writing and talking, but all of those things, life skills, um, they'll, they'll get there, they'll, you know, keep on developing and just keep encouraging them and giving them all the opportunities. And again, I just want to mention, you know, early steps. Um, we are a birth to three program in the state of Florida. You can refer children, parents can call us. Um, on the end of the stage, on each side, I do actually have some of our cards that if you know a family that isn't yet enrolled in early steps and would benefit from getting our services we do not cost families any money so we provide services in the natural environment birth to three and then we help to transition children once they turn three to school services so that 800 number is actually listed on these cards and you know feel free to take as many as you like if you're not sure about development and children's milestones or if you work in a place where this would be helpful we do have a handout also that's two-sided english on one side spanish on the other side that is um, some typical milestones starting at three months all the way up to 36 months so um, and it's got our contact information on um, you know so if a child is you know perhaps you know a family that doesn't realize their child has a delay or could you know, benefit from getting services um, from early steps. We're there to help. We're here, there to encourage families. And just um, a child doesn't have to have a, a specific diagnosis or delay to get any kind of services from us. So we're there um, to help our kids. So infants and toddlers. And this is my infant's butt. Isn't it cute? So, Jeremy, there's your butt. It is now everywhere in the world. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for joining me. Let's stay connected. Um, my information is in the Family Cafe app. Um, I will stick around if anybody, you know, has any other questions or um, wants to connect. I'm, you know, on Facebook. My email is in there if you want a copy of the presentation. So thank you for listening. Thank you for not falling asleep because if you did fall asleep, I was going to make you do Zumba. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you.